It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Welcome to our 200th episode. I'm your co-host Val in Colorado Springs and Skyping with me in Fort Collins is Steph. And in this episode, we are celebrating our milestone with a very special guest that's calling in today from Italy. And don't let Steph fool you because our guest is actually from Argentina. She's a wine superstar. And we're so excited because today with us is Dr. Laura Catena, Managing Director of Catena Zapata in Mendoza, Argentina. Welcome to the Wine to Five podcast, Laura. Buenas noches y buonasera. Buonasera. <laughs> That's a right. bon we're eight hours in Colorado. <laughs> See, but you, but you know, my, my name is Catena, which uh, many people think is Spanish, but it's actually Italian uh, because my great grandfather who founded the winery came from Le Marche in Italy. And it means, Catena means chain in Italian. Did you know that? Did I did not, not know, know that. that. <laughs> Most people don't. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, before we get into this interview and the three incredible wines that we have in front of us, I'd like to share a proper introduction of our guest. So Dr. Laura Catena is a Harvard and Stanford trained biologist and physician and the founder of Argentina's Catena Institute of Wine, which was established in 1995. She is a fourth generation vintner and is currently managing director of Bodega Catena Zapata, established in 1902, like she was just saying with her great grandfather. And her own winery called Luca was established in 1999. Laura is known as the face of Argentine wine and is the author of two books, Vino Argentino, An Insider's Guide to the Wines and Wine Country of Argentina, and Oro in Los Viñedos, Gold in the Vineyards. Wow. And we, we put the, the link to that, uh, to your website in our blog as well, so people can come find right. you. But uh, did we miss anything before we get into these wines here and the questions? No, I think I think you've hit the highlights. And I got to ask you, because I've got your Chardonnay right here in the glass, the 2015 Catena Alta Chardonnay. What do you have in your glass being that you're in uh, Venice right now? Oh, I'm, I'm having uh, Nipozzano by Fred Scovaldi. Yeah, you it's, are. I, I know, I'm... I'm I know I'm kind of cheating because it's a Tuscany wine, but you know it, it's a wine I like, so I'm drinking it because I'm, I'm in, you know, I'm in the Veneto. I should be drinking Amarone. Ah, si, uh, <laughs> Oh, just drinking wine is good for this show. Sometimes we talk about uh, Pinotage and we drink whiskey, or you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's how we roll. No shame in the Fresco Baldi game, but I want to get back to your wines because that's why we're here. And so this wine that I'm drinking, again, is the 2015 Alta Chardonnay, and it's absolutely gorgeous. I didn't even chill it. You mentioned the uh, the Grand Cru Vineyard, Adriana, when we were talking earlier. Can you tell us a little bit about that while I'm sipping on the Chardonnay here? Yeah. So, well, this the Chardonnay comes from a high altitude in Argentina, which you know, it's kind of hard for people to comprehend that we have cool climate in Argentina because, you know, when they think Argentina, they think South America and it must be warm and there's palm trees. And we do have that in Argentina. It's quite warm in the north. But when you go by the mountains, it's quite cool and we can make these very mineral Chardonnays. We have these alluvial, rocky limestone soils. And so they are ideal for making a Chardonnay with quite a bit of minerality. But what I love about the Catena Alto Chardonnay is that it also has this kind of richness. It's, it's sort of candy, but also mineral at the same time, which is why it, it usually gets drunk very quickly when I bring it to a party. I can see that. I'm sitting here. We're both drinking <laughs> while you're talking. And so we're both at our mouths full. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. like I mentioned, I didn't chill this wine because it, it, I do like my full, fuller bodied whites at a yeah. warmer temperature and, and I'm cheap. So it's not like my house is all that warm anyway here in the winter yeah. in Colorado. But I, what I didn't do was I didn't look at tasting notes because they're all sitting here on pages in front of, front of us that Dan sent us, I believe. 
all I could think of was the juicy pear fruit. And you mentioned the candy because yeah. I keep I keep candied yeah. uh, orange peel in my house as well. <laughs> and, and just the yeah. weight of this luxurious wine, I can totally see why people just kind of drink it on yeah. up when you bring it over. But yeah. Steph, what, do you, what are your thoughts on this? Oh, I thought, you know, what's so neat about it is when it evolves over time in your glass. So I gave it actually a nice hour to really uh, talk to me and kind of kept tasting it as a, at a, as it, I went along. You know, apple and butterscotch, chamomile, all these really cool, uh, beautiful aromatics. Um, I like the texture a lot. I think that was maybe one of the things that I felt it really hit home was, you know, the weight and the texture, the acidity. It's very nice. Um, just an elegant, elegant wine and does not, uh, I actually had a friend of mine who's also a sommelier, and she tasted it, and she said, I would not think this is from Argentina. Yeah, you know, well, thank you first for all the beautiful words. I think luxurious is a very good word for this wine. You know, it's because of this high altitude that will have this minerality, and then the richness comes from the, the sunlight because the, the skins get thicker. Uh, it's a protective mechanism from the plant against the sunlight, but it, it creates more tannins and more texture. So I, I think you guys have described it so well. And you asked about the Grand Cru concept. And, you know, Grand Cru is a, is a French concept. And that's what they call their wines that have achieved particularly great status because of years and years of being beautiful wines and aging well. And what I want to say to the world is that there are Grand Cru, and it means basically great growth. Mm -hmm. There's great parcels all over the world. And this wine in particular has about 80% of it comes from the Adriana Vineyard, which is at 5,000 feet elevation in this beautiful alluvial soils. And I think that this is a really special place. We planted there in 1992 when people in Argentina thought that grapes would not ripen there because it was too cold high up in the mountains. But it did. And, you know, this is not a, a wine that's not ripe. You know, it's it's got the minerality, but it's got beautiful ripeness. And, uh, I think it could be considered a Grand Cru site. And 5,000 feet, too. That What are the temperatures like? So, well, it snows several times in winter. And in summer, you know, it's usually around, you know, average of 15 degrees. But, you know, it can also go into the 20s. Sorry, I'm talking Celsius. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I, you know, I've been living between the U.S. and Argentina for, I don't know, 30 something years and I still can only think in Celsius. A normal day, uh, you know, in the evening it would go into the 40s, but you know, during the day it would be in the 70s. Mm -hmm. In the summer, I'm talking about the summer, in the winter, you know, it'll go down to 32 degrees uh, and then below when it's snowing. And then it is a problem though, sometimes we will have a frost in the summer, we'll have a few cold days and then we have to light up these little fires to save the vineyard. And so far, you know, uh, touch on wood over, you know, 25 years, we've had a few frosts, but we've never lost uh, the whole vineyard, which has happened to us in other vineyards. Yeah. And yeah, the, they call those smudge pots, I think, in some part of the world, right? Where they light the little. Yeah. 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 Now, another question I just had on this wine real quick, and then we can maybe move on to the next one, because I keep getting these like peach juice, but then I get the diacetyl from the the mallow that you guys did. And then yeah. you, 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 it says here on the notes it used new French oak. Well, we use, a, you know, a certain percentage of new French oak, but okay. we also use second use barrel. Did the note say only new French no, oak? No, no, no. It says new, not, yeah. new in two years and yeah, then French. Yeah. So, okay. you know, we, we don't do recipe winemaking. You know, when we make wine, it's like you in your kitchen, you look at your ingredients and then you decide what to do with them. We, you know, get the grapes in and then we say, oh, you know, this vintage, we just love this fruit, this particular parcel. We're not going to too much, put too much oak in this one. Then right. we have another one that's just massive. And we say, you know, this can take a little oak. We don't want the oak to overshadow the fruit. Uh, so we really decide by the parcel what to do in terms of the winemaking. 
Well, it certainly does not overshadow the fruit. And I think that's what surprised me when I looked down at the notes and I flipped them over and I went, yeah. oh, I'm getting peach yeah. juice, but I'm getting that beautiful cream that I love yeah. in a barrel fermented wine. And then and yeah. I went, new, what? I said, you know, then I saw two <laughs> years. So I, this is extremely yeah. delicious and so well balanced. And of course, we brought you, you on to, to, to drink your wine and tell you how lovely it is. But we mean it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, you. We Muchas mean gracias. It. So, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, let's go on to the next gorgeous wine. We have, uh, again, 2015, the Catena uh, Appalachian Lune Lunta Malbec. And this one actually really, for me, I wanted to, we'll, we'll again kind of talk about it, but I also really wanted to hear more about the clone and how you're studying that at the Catena Institute of Wine, among all the other things that you guys are studying there, global warming, high altitude farming. But the Malbec clones, I found that when I was watching some of your videos online, it was really neat to hear the explanation of how important the discovery has been of different Malbec clones. So if we can go into a little bit of that too, that would be great. When I started making Malbec, I knew so little about it. My dad basically said, you know, I wonder why the French didn't replant it after phylloxera. And, you know, at first we thought, well, maybe they just didn't like it. And I actually have this sort of obsession with the French language, which I acquired when I was younger and I was reading Sartre and Camus and I was going through my teenage years of existentialism. <laughs> so I actually learned French, not for wine, but so that I could read these books and go to Paris. And I asked myself that question. And so I started reading the French books and basically they thought in the 18th and 19th century that Malbec was essential as a blend component with Cabernet because it had beautiful aromas and it softened the harsh Cabernet tannins. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the reason why it was not replanted after phylloxera that hit in the end of the 19th century was because they had the little ice age in Europe, you know, the yeah. opposite of what we have now, global warming. And Malbec is very susceptible to uh, very cold weather. And so the yields would go way down. And they said, you know what, this grape is beautiful. It was actually more widely planted than Cabernet Sauvignon in the 19th century. It's in the Encyclopedia Britannica, I believe it's 1889. It's, it's the ninth edition. So Malbec was this really important variety, but you know what, it had low yields. And back then, if you had a, a, you know, a small vintage, that was a disaster. So yeah. they basically, didn't replant it in Bordeaux. It in Cahors, which is the the home lad of Malbec, mm -hmm. where it's been around since the Roman times, you know, two thousand years ago, they had all these horrible frosts and they had all these problems. So they were almost going into extinction. But then, sort of randomly, Malbec comes to Argentina. It's brought by this French guy Puget that's hired by the Argentine government to create a, a, a nursery for fine wine, and it just does so well in the climate that people keep on replanting it. And so the selections of Malbec, and you know, we don't, this vineyard is, is a Massal selection. That means that we don't have a single clone. We have hundreds of individual plants that we have actually selected the best ones, but it's not just one, it's 135 that we replant in all our vineyards. This selection of Malbec, which is extremely old, it probably dates back centuries in France, no longer exists in Europe. So I tell people, listen, tell me another grape that has a more interesting story because <laughs> it basically almost went into extinction. And had it not gone to Argentina, it probably wouldn't exist today. And the people in Cahors in France, which is the homeland of Malbec, they say if it weren't for Argentina, we wouldn't exist today because then Malbec from Argentina made the variety well known again. And now Cahors is thriving. So the selection of Malbec is not only precious because you know, it's in my wine and it's been in my family for so long. You know, I, my family's been making Malbec since 1902. But it's also important for my region and also for the world of wine. This is this beautiful variety that might have been lost. And this particular wine comes from the Lulunta vineyard, which is a vineyard planted in the 1930s. And it's named Angelica after my grandmother. And the selection there is very diverse. In fact, when you go there, 
you know, if you're a professional viticulturist, you might say, hey, you know, these plants are so different one from the other. And there's this idea in viticulture that you want all the plants to be the same. You want them to ripen at the same time. And what I've found is that these diverse populations actually give you better wine because you do want a slightly less ripe grape with a more ripe grape because that gives you a more complex flavor. So this is something that I feel very strongly about. And, you know, the other place where they feel strongly about this is in Burgundy. You know, in Burgundy, they are preserving Massal selections. In fact, they've gone through their vineyards trying to find, you know, pre-philoxeric Pinot Noir because they feel strongly about preserving the selections. And with global warming, this is even more important because possibly the kind of vines that were selected in the last 20 years, you know, won't thrive with global warming. So we need to have a greater diversity of vine material. So, yeah, I'm very passionate about this uh, Massal selection of Malbec, which includes, you know, as you said, several clones. We also have done some selections of a few clones that we think are particularly good for quality, but we always keep the Massal selection planted in every vineyard because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. I think what was something, first of all, Steph, we've never done a Malbec grape gab and shame on us. At least if we have, I can't yeah. find it. And shame <laughs> well, on no, us. We haven't. We yeah. haven't. I mean, so, we did an intro to Argentina episode years ago, and that's and we left it at that. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I think we called yeah. it uh, two to tango, something like that. This so, is how we make up for it, though. Yeah, you yeah. Know, we, just, <laughs> we just bring the superstar on the show, and then she tells everybody. And another thing wow. that you mentioned um, in a video also was that the Malbec, of course, you, you mentioned over 135 clones here, but you mentioned that the Malbec in Argentina, of course, is not the same Malbec that was replanted in France and that the berries were, I believe, smaller. Yeah, yeah. So if you uh, look at Cot, yes. which is the other name for Malbec, which is what's planted outside of Argentina, it usually has bigger bunches, bigger berries, because they were looking to preserve a Malbec that would give higher yields and that would be sturdier. And so what came to Argentina is more diverse and there's more of these small bunch of small berries, which we think give the best quality in Argentina. I, I don't want to, you know, bad mouth Cot because I think you can make some great wines with Cot as well with the other version of Malbec. But I'm just happy that there's a lot of different kinds of Malbec. You know, I think of vines as people, you know, diversity is always better. And you see it in the wines. The wines are more interesting when you have a diversity of plant material. Yeah, that they are. And so speaking of interesting, Val, what did you think of this particular Malbec? I had sent Steph a note last night, actually. I had a day yesterday and I sat down and my lunch wasn't till what, 3.30 or something, Steph? I said, I'm going something to lunch like, like 3.30 or 4. I'm finally getting lunch and I hadn't eaten since 8.30 that morning. I'm like, I'm starving. So I'm having this leftover lamb and I opened this bottle and I think I sent Steph a note that said, I may have some of this left for the podcast tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so that ought to tell you what I think of this, because first of all, let, can I just mention the price? I think he wrote $25 on this bottle, which is ridiculous. But I love, first of all, the approachability of it. I love the the fruit, all those fruits on the nose, the dark fruits. I love the blackberry that I'm getting in there. I love all that spice. And I see here that you did use a little bit of wood on there as well. But it, again, it doesn't overpower. Malbec can stand up to some wood. And I think sometimes it really likes the wood. And so I find it to be a nice full-bodied wine, but still approachable where I didn't really need the lamb. So I poured another glass. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> right. That's well, completely yeah. right. You know, I'm so glad about what you're saying about lamb because people always say, you know, Malbec and beef. And actually, I think that Malbec has a kind of gaminess that goes well with other mm. kinds of meats, you know, lamb, chicken. You know, it, I actually think it's one of the few red wines that can pair with spicy food because of the soft tannins. Right. And I also love Malbec and mushrooms. That's a yes. personal sort of obsession of mine because, you know, Mushrooms are the most umami of all the vegetables and any meal like a risotto with mushrooms or mushrooms with pasta, mushrooms with anything will go really well with Malbec. And actually, Jancis Robinson, you know, the famous wine writer, once told me that she thinks that some of her favorite Malbecs make her think a little bit of Pinot Noir. And the first time she said that to me, I said, well, that, that, well that's kind of weird because, you know, Malbec is a Bordeaux variety. 
But actually, Malbec has the, these soft tannins. You know, that's why it was always blended with Cabernet because it complemented it. And I think that if you were to close your eyes and not look at the really dark color of Malbec, you would taste this softness that makes it so easily paired with so many different kinds of foods. I think I have to echo what Jansa said because I have in my notes here, it says Pinot lovers would even love this. And oh my so, God. That's yeah, amazing. I, I said, and it's, I put drink now, buy often, you know, sweet red fruits, which is, you know, can be like a yeah. Pinot, yeah, um, yeah. some floral notes, but very juicy, you know, but the, but the tannins and the weight really is, has the softness that I think, you know, these people who prefer lighter reds, yeah. you know, this was, I thought, you know, I would put this in front of a Pinot person and say, what do you think that, you know, what do you think yeah. of this wine? Yeah. yeah, no, I agree. I have to say that I have a little regret. I was uh, at my dental appointment yesterday and the woman cleaning my teeth mentioned she loved wines, but I hadn't opened this one yet and she loves Pinots. <laughs> now I will tell oh. you, <laughs> I will tell you that she tells me, yeah, I open bottles and I have a glass and then I come back a couple of months later after keeping it in the fridge. Oh, oh my God. God. I oh said, no. No, no. Don't do that. <laughs> but but I she asked if there was another kind I would recommend and you know I went straight to like Sicily and I went to Oregon Pinots and and then I I had not even approached the Malbec in my mind, but after what she told me the kind of wine she likes and after pouring this, I thought, you know what? I should have told her this one. And had I opened it, yeah, she, yeah, she would have got that recommendation. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it is. It is an approachable wine for especially people that really like, you know, they want that that fruit sweetness. This wine is not sweet. Yeah. It's dry. No. No, no, it's dry. Yeah, but it does have the yeah. fruit that I think a lot of a, a New World markets particularly like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, there is an interesting thing about Malbec is that it has uh, naturally a lot of polysaccharides. So polysaccharides are in the sugar family, but they're not sugar. Mm -hmm. So even a completely dry Malbec like this one will have this, you know, I don't, I don't know if I want to call it sweetness because people don't like sweet wines, no. but it has this yeah. soft smoothness that makes it go so well with food. And, you know, you can drink Malbec alone and it's never too tannic. Uh, but it is because of these polysaccharides uh, in the tannins. We studied this at the Catena Institute. Well, I would go with juicy. I think that's how I yes. would describe it. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Is juicy. Right. Yeah, I you think know, juicy, is a, juicy is a good yeah. word. Yeah. 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 Speaking of good, let's get to this next one because I have them both in the glass side by side. And you can actually see the visual difference as far as the the opaqueness of the wine, the limpidness of the wine, as the Italians would use. And this is the... The Malbec Argentino. <laughs> Malbec Ar did you, Is that a hard G? Argentino? Uh, Argentino. 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 Yeah, okay. almost like a J. Argentino. Argentino. Okay, I'm very yeah. bad at that, but it is the 2015. No, and this is gorgeous. But the artwork... Wow is absolutely stunning on this label. So we're not judging a bottle by the label, but I can see where this award-winning artwork, it was based on this play. This well, no, so the play is based on the label. So there's definitely a connection. I got it backwards. And no, no, that's good. You know, this wine is definitely richer, like just as much as the, the Lunda to me goes in that Pinot Noir direction. I think the Malbec Argentino is a richer wine. It's big. It's also juicy, but it's, it's more on the bigger style. To talk about the label, Basically, I have a sister who has a PhD in history. She went to Oxford University. Mm -hmm. She's a professor now. And, you know, I, I used to always get annoyed when people would ask me, what's next in Argentina after Malbec? And, you know, Malbec is this survivor grape. It's got this fascinating story, you know, 2000 years old. It, it was brought back in Argentina. It would have died otherwise. And, you know, there's so much more to explore from Argentina. I think most people don't really know about the different regions of Argentina. There's just so much more left to learn about Argentine Malbec, partly because in Argentina, we haven't done such a great job about describing these differences. But thank you for calling me because now I get to talk to people about it. But I wanted this story to be told 
Uh, because there isn't something next in Argentina. Yes, there's Bonarda, there's this beautiful Chardonnay, there's blends, there's all kinds of regionality, but there's so much more to be explored about Malbec. And one time I got asked this question by a journalist and I said, well, would you ask Aubert de Vilaine, you know, the owner of Romane Conti, the most famous wine in the world, what comes after Pinot Noir and Burgundy? You know, and, and yeah. the journalist says, well, of course, I wouldn't ask him that. And I said, why are you asking me the same question about my <laughs> And And so, so, you know, I was going through this kind of existential crisis about why are people asking me this question? And I had talked to my sister and I said, you know, you're in a story and how do I tell the story? And she said, well, I don't know a lot about sales or, you know, because I teach. But, you know, what we sell is wine. You ought to put it on the label. And I thought, oh, there goes little sister again you know, with with her good advice, because she is my much younger sister. And she, I said, you know, Adriana, she's also got the name of the, our famous vineyard. I said, Adriana, oh, what would you put on the label? And she said, you know, the story is so interesting because there's all these amazing women in the story of Malbec. There's Eleanor of Aquitaine, who supposedly drank it at her wedding. Then we have Phylloxera, the plague that caused the extinction of vines in Europe that is an insect that mostly exists in the female form. You know, we needed to have a, a villain that was female. Then we have all the women in our family. My great-grandmother, Anna Mosheta, who is the second character, the immigrant, she worked alongside my great-grandfather, and he used to call her you know, the Spanish equivalent of the vine whisperer because she planted all the vineyards. And when she planted them, they did well. And then we have our family with myself working with my dad and my sister. And so my sister said, listen, most of history is told through the eyes of men. Let's make the story about these beautiful, strong women. And so she came up with the, the storytelling and the four women. And then we had Stranger and Stranger, which is this pretty cool agency in mm -hmm. London designed the label. And yeah, so there's the label. And if you look, there's lots of little details. For example, we have the bridge of Cahors, the birthplace of Malbec. We have the monkey drinking wine because in Eleanor of Aquitaine's court, there were monkeys. And then we have the mountains of Argentina. We have our pyramid shaped winery. And it's been really fun selling this wine. But again, as you said, I'm glad that you're saying it's about the wine first, because I would hate to have a wine that was all about the label, but I'm pretty happy with the wine. So it complements, the label complements the wine. Oh, definitely. I mean, there's so much going on with that artwork. Yeah, yeah. We wrote in here that Drinks Business uh, gave it a Best Design and Packaging Award. Yeah. Something we didn't mention is the vines were planted in 1920. Yeah, so the actual vines we're planting in 1930. Okay. I don't know. Does it say 1920 on the sheet? It's, it does. It's, it's 1930. Okay. There, you know, it might have been somewhat pl started planting in 1920, but I usually use the word 1930s because that's what we have for sure. It's a blend actually of vineyard planted in 1930s, and then those same vines, that selection was planted in another vineyard that was planted in the 19 early 1990s, and so it's a blend of two vineyards with the same. Massal plant selection of Malbec. And when was it first released? So Malbec Argentino is a wine we've been making since 2004, but the new label is since 2015. Okay. And has the wine stayed the same? Sorry, Val. I'm oh, sorry. Mean to cut you no, off. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm too excited. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many questions and so much good wine. We're just loosening up now and we're like, oh, we want to ask all these things. But, um, uh, you know, so how, has the wine stayed, you know, somewhat the same or has it changed a lot since 2004? So we did change one of the vineyard sites before it used to come from Adriana and now it comes from Nicasia because we thought that the old vine vineyard complemented really well the Nicasia vineyard. We, we just kind of played around with the blend and we said, you know what, we want this to be a fully old vine wine. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to use more of the old vine vineyard in this blend, the 2015. So I think it's a little more luxurious, but the wine itself as sort of an icon for Malbec in the sense that if you drink this wine, it could not be any other variety. You know, it's Malbec. And we've kept that as the core of the wine, that it's just very Malbec-y. You know, it's, it's the core <laughs> of Becky. I love yeah. that descriptor. But, you know, it really has this strength and power and it needs like this 2015, in my opinion, 
you know, needs more time or at least some decanting and, and some air time. But what do you recommend as far as this 2015 goes, like a drinking window or recommendation for aging? Well, I think that if you drink it now, I would drink it with food. I think this wine you can easily age for 10, 20, 30 years, no problem. But, you know, I like my wines with a little age. I probably keep it for about five years or I do what, what I do, which is to buy a couple of bottles and then I drink one every year and I like to see how it progresses. Or you could give it to your dentist and <laughs> they, <laughs> they would keep it in the fridge and then it, it would probably be amazing a week later. Seriously, That's I actually true. did have a bottle of this wine that I kept for a couple of days and, you know, I was about to throw it away and I tasted it and I thought, wow, it's still really good. <laughs> so I think this is one of those wines that you could probably drink over a couple of days and it would be fine. Well, I have to say I Coravand it. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that's an even better idea. Coravan, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I did that. And I, I kind of, you know, I find you as interesting as your wine. And it is almost oh. as if this wine is a representation of all the complexities that are going on with you. Because I just kind of want to just kind of wander off a minute. You mentioned your sister. You said she went to Oxford and she's a professor. You are also a physician. I don't know if our listeners yeah. know that. So <laughs> I, I hear that you're a family of underachievers. <laughs> well, no, you know, no, the, I mean, we do study pretty hard. That That is kind of the, the family thing, studying. Um, I have to say my kids don't like to read. I'm, I'm totally depressed about it, but they're great kids and they do well in school. But, uh, you know, the way my sister and I and my brother and I read as kids, my kids, uh, you know, can barely finish a book. So I, I don't know what's going to happen with the next generations, although, Actually, one of them is already working at the winery and loves it. And he, he actually likes the farming side, which is probably more important than reading books, really, to make great wine. So I, I don't mind that he doesn't like to read that much. But I studied biology because I really loved science. And, you know, the great U.S. educational system allows you to do biology and almost minor in French. Uh -huh. You know, this it, is what I love about you know, the U.S. educational system. I'm in Italy now and I live in Argentina. And, you know, in Europe and in Argentina, you have to decide your career when you're 18. And if you're going to study economics, you are never going to read a French book or an Italian book or a literature book again in school. And I, I feel so grateful that you know, I studied biology, but I got such a great humanities education. I studied art and, you know, in, in making wine and in, in doing all this research and history, I, I felt like I had a little extra training, you know, even going and reading all these French books. So, you know, I, I'm just interested in things in general, like like you guys are, you know, yeah. I love to read, I love to research. Um, and then medicine, I basically went to medicine because I thought that I wasn't going to help anybody with wine and I didn't want to be the loser going to work with her dad, oh. which is the dumb, dumbest thing ever because I love working with my dad. He is the most amazing mentor. He has mentored me through so many things. We work so great together. And when you work with your dad, you know that you have each other's best interest and he supports me in everything I do. He is so pro women you know, also pro men, just pro great people. And, you know, when I was 16, I was very close to my dad, but I never thought that I would work with him. And I thought I want to be a doctor because I want to save people. I want to help the world. And I thought, who am I going to help with wine? And actually, I did ask my dad when I was in medical school, I said, Dad, how do you feel about being in the alcohol industry? You know, there's all these problems with alcoholism. And he said, Laurita, that's what he calls me. Hmm you have nothing to worry about because we sell fine wine and there are no fine wine alcoholics. That's right. <laughs> oh my God. So, but, but then when I, I basically started working with my dad because I, he sent me to this wine show when I was a doctor and he said, listen, you have to go. It was the New York wine experience, the wine spectator thing. He said, you know, first Argentine winery, South American winery to be invited. Nobody here speaks English. Well, you have to go. I go to this thing and there's these huge long lines in, in front of the, French, Italian, California wineries. And, you know, I've got, I'm there alone in my little booth and barely anybody's coming by because they would read, you know, Argentina and they would say, you know, we're talking 1995, you know, I've never heard of Argentina making wine. I, I'm going to move on. And so I called my dad and I said, dad, I need to help you. And I mostly started because 
I thought I should help my dad. And also because my dad and I had developed a love over wine. He used to visit me in college and we would do tastings. But mostly it was because I wanted to help my dad and my country. And then what I realized is that my region has been transformed. There's better schools, better hospitals. There's cafes everywhere. I mean, Mendoza used to be a pretty poor region. And with wine, it's been completely transformed. And, you know, if you run a responsible business that is good to the environment, that works on organic viticulture and sustainability, you are helping people in the world as much as you are helping people by being a doctor. But, you know, when you're 16, you, you know, your your mind is just more narrow. And so now I feel that, you know, making wine and farming and keeping alive these farming traditions, these Malbec selections is for sure as important as being a doctor or a teacher, all these professions that I used to think were you know, the only way to help the world. Of course, doctors are great, nurses are great, teachers are great, but there's so many ways to contribute to improving the life of people. And I, I do think wine is one of them. It's good for your health on top of things in moderation, and it makes you happy. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. We, we agree. We agree with that wholeheartedly. And, you know, we have connected with so many listeners where they say they listen to our show and it's made a big difference in their lives, whether it's given them the education they needed to move on uh, or up ahead in their job or they're, you know, needing encouragement to pursue something they're really excited about, you know, with wine. And we don't even know how it's impacting people. And that's, you know, yeah. I think the wine world in general, and I mean world, you know, it's you can make a difference um, in all different ways, like what you mentioned but uh, the other thing I thought that came to mind when uh, you were talking about being 16 and thinking that going into medicine was the way to do it and, and not following in your family's footsteps, you know, some of that, too, is just like, you know, when you're fiery and independent as a yeah. teenager, you know, I mean, I think that is just the way that we mature, you know, because yeah. it's like, I'm going to do my own yeah. thing, yeah. you know, <laughs> nobody's going to tell me what I can or cannot do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Preach. I'm the first doctor in my, in my family. You know, there, there were no doctors in my family. Um, but you know, all that, the biology I learned and the research has helped me a lot in preserving Malbec. You know, the, the vision of the Katana Institute is to use science to preserve nature and culture and there are so many threats to agriculture right now. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's cities moving in, there's water shortage, there's climate change, there's phylloxera, there's so many things happening. And actually, my scientific background really helps me. So I always say to my dad, you know, actually, going to medical school was pretty good preparation. <laughs> oh, and it, totally. And when I the first time I heard about the Katana Institute of Wine was actually on one of the Women of the Vine and Spirits webinars oh, yeah. that you were on. Yeah. And yeah. I just took all these notes and I was just mm -hmm. super excited. And so, you know, having you here with us is really such a treat for, for us. So thank you so much. No, oh, thank you guys. And thank you for what you do. I, you know, wine has so much culture, art. It's something that, that, pro that provokes joy. They actually have done studies where they show that people who drink wine smile more. And, yeah. you know, we wow. it, we can't ha have our lives be all about, you know, having our jobs and getting our paycheck. And I think wine brings so much joy to people. And it's got this farming culture behind that is so rich in, in culture and traditions. But when you drink a bottle of wine, you can connect to that. You can go visit wine country. And the more you learn about wine, the more interesting it is to visit wine producing regions or talking to somebody at a restaurant who can tell you about the wine. I think the world of wine is so fascinating and it's so great to see how interested people are in wine. And where could we, if we wanted to visit Luca Wines, tell us about yeah. your own label. Yeah. <laughs> well, so Luca uh, is a, a project that I started in 1999 because you know, Catena, all our wines come from our own vineyards. And I had watched how producers in the U.S. and Europe were making beautiful wines from grapes that they were purchasing from producers. But, you know, there's wines like Sine Qua Non that are superb wines, you know, age-worthy wines, really distinctive wines that were being made from a grower that has some particularly old vines. And so 
there were all these old vines in Argentina. 50% of the vineyards in Argentina are owned by small producers, so less than five hectares, less than 10 acres, because it, the inheritance law in Argentina is that properties usually get split up. So there's all these little producers, and they couldn't really make their own wine because it would be hard for them to sell it. And a lot of these vineyards were being pulled out and replanted with you know, high production varieties because Malbec is not a high producing variety. So I basically got in a car with one of our viticulturalists and we went to visit all the growers and we talked to them about this project. We said, you know, we'll pay you by the hectare so you don't have to worry about yields because most old vines give lower yields. All old vines give lower yields than young vines. And so we started working with these growers and that's how Luca was born. Now, you know, I make some wines from some of my family's vineyards, uh, the Rosas, Nico by Luca Rosas comes from really old vines from grower vineyards, but it was kind of a revolution. I was the first to really use these old vine vineyards because most people in Argentina thought, oh, you know what, the growers, they're all about high yields. They don't care about the quality. And once I started working with these growers, they were so proud. And I actually have a project called La Posta where I put the name of the growers on the label. And I then give them, you know, I sell them the wine for cost, like nothing. And they all buy so much wine for their parties to give us gifts. And, <laughs> you know, and then I have a deal with them that if they ever want to use the trademark, it's theirs. And it's been one of the most fun projects I've ever done because it's their name on the label. And they they love it. They want to make the best grower wine. Like they compete with the other growers that, that I work with. But it's keeping this small grower culture alive in Argentina, which I think is is part of why it's such an exciting place to make wine. And so Luca was a lot about that. Um, then, you know, with Luca, I get to do crazy stuff like, you know, Pinot Noir. I have an old vine Syrah, which everybody always tells me, oh, God, nobody can sell Syrah, but the wine is beautiful. So it sells. And I get to do all these really fun things. And Luca does happen to be the name of my oldest son. Uh huh. And what's the distribution like? I mean, would it be easy for us to find? We're in Colorado. What oh, are the yeah. chances? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I have a national importer that's different than Winebo. It, they're called mm-hmm. Vine Connections. But if you look in their website, vineconnections.com, they have all their distributors. So you okay. you should be able to find it. And, and I think we actually sell quite a bit in Colorado. Good. Yeah. Okay, we'll yeah. look for it. That's awesome. Yeah. That makes sense. And I just want to put out there that I met my husband over a glass of Argentinian Malbec. So there. <laughs> oh, what a beautiful story. I, I love that. I, I kept the receipt from the wine bar. It's still sitting oh in my dresser. My I'm like, look, this is the receipt from the glass of wine I bought the night That's I met great. you. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> but we also understand that you've got a new film series. It starts with wine, which is kind of in line of what we were just talking about. I mean, Steph and I, our friendship started with wine. So that kind of says something about the relationships that we've built through doing this. But this series is on Amazon and we want everyone to watch it, but we don't give anything away. So let's <laughs> uh, let's wet their whistle here. Tell us a little bit about this theme, this, uh, this yeah. series. Well, actually, uh, you know, Wine Enthusiast, the, the wine magazine, uh-huh. um, talked to several producers, us included, about doing this movie. And, you know, when they first talked to us about it, they really didn't have a deal to have it on Amazon or Netflix or anything. And it was kind of a crazy thing to jump into this because, you know, other than the Psalm movies, there's just not a lot of great movies about wine. There's, you know, Chef's Table. Mm -hmm. That's amazing about food. There's Mm -hmm. great food TV, but there are not a lot of great uh, wine movies. And so, you know, they came to us and I met the director, uh, you know, the guy who was going to be in charge of the filming, Colin West. And I love this guy. You know, he spoke my language. He cared about the real stuff. He wanted to meet the people. He wanted to tell the story of Argentina, the story of our winery. And, you know, I'm, I'm an instinctive person. You know, with any project, if it feels right, I go with it. So we basically went with it on, on this pilot project. And then it got on Amazon Prime. Begin, It started in January. And then all of a sudden, Colin sends me a text that he said, we're trending on Amazon Prime. And I'm thinking, what? You know, and then I look on my Amazon Prime and I see it there next to, <laughs> you know, some like, I don't know, Law and Order or some one of those super famous shows. And the movie is basically, it follows me and this chef, Deborah del Corral, who is 
so amazing. We had so much fun doing the movie together. And we basically make food in the countryside. We talk to the people picking the grapes, to the winemakers. And then they actually wanted to film me as a doctor. So part of the movie is also in San Francisco at the hospital I work. So, you know, I think they did a great job and I've heard great reviews. I mean, at this point, you know, I kind of hate watching myself in the movie. So, um, you know, I, I hope it's good, but I've gotten great feedback about the movie and I think it shows different parts of Argentina. You know, they filmed a demonstration. You know, we have a lot of demonstrations in Argentina. That's part of democracy. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad they included that. And I think they actually did a great job with the film. And they have two other uh, episodes, one from Uruguay and one from California. And I don't know. It's pretty exciting. I watched all three of them. And I have to oh, say, yes, and <laughs> I think they were all very good. And I've been telling telling my like wine friends here in Fort Collins about it and recommending it to them because, you know, even though. Every single episode, because there's three episodes, every single one includes a chef and it's, you know, wine yeah. and food. But what is distinctive about each of the episodes is like your episode really highlights music and like togetherness and like the environment and like the, that one scene where there is a aria from an opera oh and, my god right oh my god. We, As, we were all we were all crying i mean oh I my gosh that part but so this is one of our winemakers who is an opera singer and you know the the day he came and i said you're gonna sing aren't you and he's like laura i can't sing i'm too shy on camera and i said nasty you've got to do it and he says he was sitting there thinking i can't do it i can't do it and then when his turn came he sang and we were all crying it was, oh, it so was very moving. Yeah. 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 I loved it. I totally loved it. And so each one is has its own little life that it brings to yeah. the wine world, but they're not all the same. So that's why yeah. I encourage everybody to watch it because, you know, if you love food and wine, you're just it's it's a thrilling uh series to watch because it's you know not one dimensional like it's just about wine you know it's really yeah. more encompassing yeah. the wine lifestyle and the yeah and yeah so very very cool. nice oh, I'm so, thank you i'm so glad you guys liked it yes yes and you know this is the part of the interview where we ask you to share the embarrassing or funny wine story and you know we do this and it's so hilarious it's our favorite thing because we get we get everybody to share something that you know you survived this embarrassing story and it relates to all of us who make mistakes and yeah. you know shake our heads at ourselves and go how did yeah. I do that and you know and then years later it's just it's silly but you know it felt devastating yeah. maybe at first <laughs> yeah well uh, I got I have so many embarrassing stories I mean my first was learning how to spit that is so difficult now I am a pro. <laughs> but actually, I think learning how to spit takes about two or three years. But but the story, I, I mean, I don't know if this is that funny, but I once was doing a presentation of my wines and I was going from, you know, like my least expensive wine to my most expensive wine, which I think all my wines are great. And, you know, I'm not a wine snob. I like to drink wines of all prices. You know, I can drink a beautiful $10 wine that's the perfect wine. And then, you know, I will splurge for my dad's birthday, a wine from his birth year. And I'm not going to tell you how much I paid for it. It was a Latour 1939, <laughs> oh, but it was a lot of money. Wow. Yeah. But it, but it was worth it, you know, so I, yeah. I, I drink on all extremes, but so I was doing this tasting for my least expensive, most expensive wine, except that I had the order wrong. So I have this whole group of sommeliers in front of me and I start with the wine that's like my best wine, thinking that it's my least expensive wine. So I start talking about it. And I'm like, wow, you guys, I think this might be the best wine we've ever made for this brand. You know, and I'm talking and talking about it. And then I get to the middle wine and I'm like, okay, this wine's so three wines. So the middle one was correct. And then I get to the one that's supposed to be my, you know, my icon wine. And I'm like, well, you know, this wine and I'm like I'm trying to figure out like wow this really is not <laughs> tasting like one of like you know like one of my top wines and and I'm like well you know and I'm start thinking and then all of a sudden the guy that was in charge of the thing realizes I've done the whole thing wrong 
And I had to admit in front of this whole group of like 50 sommeliers that I was basically having the wrong order of wines. And I don't know if that's that funny, but, you know, at least I didn't say the wrong thing until the end. I started really fumbling, you know, yeah. about, you know, yeah. how can I say that I don't think this wine is like <laughs> worth this hundred dollar price oh because gosh, it was a $10 yeah. wine and it was a beautiful $10 wine. But I'm thinking this doesn't have the richness, the complexity of a hundred dollar wine. But, you know, my thing about making mistakes and believe me, this is I, I've done so many foibles with wine, but from being a doctor, this is what I say at my winery. Sometimes they've made a mistake. I mean, we did once send ship to Puerto Rico for the summer Cabernet instead of Chardonnay. And oh. they were like, okay, nobody in Puerto Rico drinks Cabernet Sauvignon in the summer. So what are we doing with this wine? And yeah. my, you know, the people in the winery were horrified. And I said, listen, guys, you know, was a small child hurt? Because, you know, I work in pediatric emergency. They said, no, I was like, okay, Guys, I mean, obviously, they showed me how it happened. It was an honest mistake. And I said, listen, let's figure out how not to make it happen again, but let's move on. And I really have that philosophy. You know, I take care of people who are so sick. And really, you know, nothing is that important other than your health and your family and your friends. So I, I have to say that in general, I I don't waste too much time when I make all the mistakes that I've made because really at a wine tasting making a mistake like the mistake I made with the wines okay it's not that important maybe it makes me look a little silly or or not knowing my wines very well but in the end nobody was hurt and people are very forgiving you know they were happy that I was there and you know we started the tasting again and we were all fine and I think that one should be forgiving because wine is for fun and You know, I do think that sometimes people take wine too seriously, and that's definitely the wrong approach. Agreed. I think you had a really good message in your story also. Well, first of all, you know your product. You knew when you got to the, you know, the lower end of production, you're like, wait a minute, something's off here. And I'm sure all those sommeliers were like, all right, all right, she might have messed up the order, but she obviously isn't trying to put one over on us. She knows her product. And and then the second thing, like you said, it is important to learn how to recover from these things because... Because everybody who listens is either an enthusiast or somebody in the industry or somebody wants to be in the industry. And this is going to happen to all of us. And so being able to recover, especially in front of a crowd or a presentation seminar and whatever, that's part of it. And again, your third perspective, it's it's perspective, your third point, you know, did somebody get hurt over this? No. And I, I have to say, you know, it's just like if you come from a world where sometimes decisions are being made like in my case it might have been you know in a military situation oh absolutely right so i'm not i'm not briefing a general on why he can't have this or that or this you know during a war i'm talking about wine here and so i always say it's just wine man and that you put that in perspective (laughs) it's still the livelihood of people we still take it seriously yes Yes. but we don't take ourselves seriously yeah i totally agree with that i couldn't agree more yeah so I think your your story had a bunch of great messages, don't you think, Steph? Oh, yeah. I mean, Val and I totally agree with you on this. And we say all the time to each other, you know, the mission hasn't failed and we haven't killed anybody. And, you yeah. know, we really usually say mission hasn't failed because <laughs> Val came from, you know, the Air Force and really was dealing with very wow. extreme missions. And then yeah. I was coming from oncology pharmacy dealing with chemotherapy uh, yeah. and stuff. And you're just like, you don't mess around with something. No, but no, with wine, no. you can be more forgiving yeah. of yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so it is important to have that perspective. And then, you know, yeah, not take everything too seriously. Um yeah. but you know, wine is a business. It is a science. There's a lot of yeah. that stuff that you know deserves the attention and the yeah. serious times. You know, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. I could sit here, and I know Steph. Steph shares this. We could sit here and just chat with you another <laughs> hour. But I know Steph has to get on the road here shortly, and I know it's very late there. And so, before we kind of close out with you, is there anything else that you want to share with our listeners? How they can connect with you online? Anything we missed here in this beautiful conversation today? Well, uh, I do have an Instagram account, which is uh, Laura Catena MD. I tried to get the Laura Catena account, but a woman in Italy had it 
because, oh. you know, my name is Italian. But so it's yeah. Laura Catena MD. And on Twitter, I'm just Laura Catena. And so people can um, contact me through there and uh, they can write to the winery. The email at the winery is turismo at catenazapata.com. But if you just Google the winery, you can find the site. And, you know, the only thing I would like is to stay on for an hour to ask you, Val and Steph, about your lives. So. <laughs> That's the next time when, when we the meet next over a one. glass of wine. Yeah, that would be. Or amazing. we'll meet you. We'll meet you either in Italy or in Argentina, and we can do that. Perfect. Or in the I states, you never know. Or in the states, yes. So that's a deal. Yes, if you are ever in Colorado, please reach out. Steph yeah. and I are okay. like both, you know, on either sides of Denver. We will come to you wherever you wherever uh, you go. So we would love that, to meet up with you. That would be amazing. Me too. I would love to uh, have a glass of wine with you guys. Love and it. I will say one more thing as far as connecting and uh, learning more and getting more uh, information. The Katana Malbec YouTube channel is super oh. impressive. So I yes. just want to let everybody know because a lot of people are into watching videos. And Laura, you're so great in front of a camera, obviously, with the Amazon series. It is uh, a joy to go through that YouTube channel and check out a lot of those videos. So, and especially with the Argentino wine label videos where the labels come to life. Yeah, that's, yeah, pretty, that's, that's pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have fun watching those myself. <laughs> yeah. 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 The Phyloxera lady. I really like yeah, her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's kind of creepy, but it totally yeah. gets the point across. So, yeah. yes. Well, it's been a pleasure, and thank you so much for being here today with us. Oh, thank you, guys. Thanks, Val. Thanks, Seth, and thanks to all the listeners. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, guys, and hope to meet you both soon. You too. Enjoy, Italy. Okay, gracias. Grazie mille. <laughs> Buona serata. Bye. Buona Bye. serata. I can't handle how wonderful she is, Steph. Yeah, uh, that dude. I think she's one of my most ex- like the probably one of the times I've been the most excited about a guest. I know. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, let's ask her about the play. They're talking about the play because I went and stalked her on Instagram. There's so much to talk about. I mean, I like we didn't even talk about like visiting the winery, which my friend Cheryl has been to the winery, and she's just like, oh my god, it's so amazing, and you know, that's. There's so much to talk about because, you know, they have history and significance and they're making an impact in the world of wine in a major way with the Institute. And it's just really a lot. And she was so real. Yeah. I know. And that she like, she's like, I want to hear about you guys. It's like, well, that's very nice of you. Oh, I know. (laughs) I know. But what an interesting person and her sister. And I mean, just so much. And then, like you said, there's just so much to cover. And then, like you said, the video, she's so photogenic, so beautiful, so great on camera. Such a, I'm, I could go on. I can't stand it. I know. I can't stand it, too. So, uh, yes, definitely a big thank you and shout out to Lara and the time that she took away from her family and her business life and uh, being in Italy to be with us. I am so happy about that. Yes. And big thanks also to Dan Fredman and he's at Dan Fredman PR, PR and marketing to the thirsty. And you can connect with him on Twitter at D Fredman. And we have to really give him, you know, the props because he made this interview possible for us today and helped get us the samples and put us in contact with Laura. So thank you so much, Dan. And next up is our last Patreon drawing. And this time it is extra special because it is our 200th episode. And we obviously have these incredible wines, which we will also put on in our blog the retail value of the wines and stuff. But just to let you know, we were really celebrating today. We had some very nice wines, very extraordinary guest. So this was a a big milestone, 200 episodes. Man, and the person who's going to win this drawing, what are they going to get, Val? They're getting a whole bunch of swag. This is, this is what I called on the blog last week, the swag bonanza, because we're getting 
books. We have Rosé Wine by Jennifer Simonetti Bryant. We have Tasting the Past by Kevin Bagos. We have Govinos. We have Wine to Five t-shirts. We still have some WTSO and Weekly Tasting swag. And so we're going to give all this stuff away. It's about $200 total. And we're going to just gonna send it on out. So I'm going to put the numbers in the randomizer right now. And Steph is going to call it. Oh, 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 blue. 133. So, who is 133? This always feels like bingo. Blue, 133. It is. I just went to a drag bingo night the other night on, you know, Did you say drag bingo? Oh, yeah. And that queen, she was amazing. I love it. Drag bingo. I want to do that. Uh, But, (laughs) but, so our winner for 133 is Kathy S. Oh, awesome. Is that side hassle? Side Hustle Wino. That's Side Hustle. Oh, my gosh. Side Hustle Winos. Kathy, so, so happy for you. Congratulations. We will get that stuff to you. And I believe she's in Atlanta. She's been on the show before as well. Totally. Yeah. So raising our glasses to Here's episode Kathy. 200, our $200 worth of swag to all of you listeners. And I just love this so much. But you guys can also check our... <laughs> This wine is just good. <laughs> We're like this, Kathy. And this Kathy. is for you, my friend. Oh my goodness! You can find goodies also on our website, wine 5com We're in the social spaces at wine t w o f i v e. And until next week, in which we will be celebrating our season finale, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine TWO5. And tune in next week for more fun and useful SIP tips.